I'm Angel Rizzolo and it's that time again. It's time for my talk. Today I talk about reflections on the death of Queen Elizabeth II. Over 4.1 billion people across the globe tuned in to watch the funeral of Queen Elizabeth II on September 19, 2022. Her death sent Great Britain and indeed the world into mourning. Queen Elizabeth II was the longest reigning monarch in the world, having reigned for all of 70 years. Queen Elizabeth was the personification of dignity and decorum. Although her role was mostly ceremonial, she provided inspirational leadership to many. As the ceremonial leader of Britain and the Commonwealth of Nations, wherever and whenever she turned up, her presence was accompanied by utmost splendor. She did have a glorious reign and she became embedded in the hearts of the British people. Therefore, on one level, for many, Elizabeth II represented stability in a changing world. With the death of their mother, the British and much of the world bewailed her loss. The British people were thrown into an extended period of grief. Masses of tearful mourners congregated the streets to pay their respects. A stillness reigned over Britain as the loss seemed a tangible thing. Leaders around the world from Canada, the US and others paid her tributes. UN Secretary General said she was admired for her grace and dignity. Putin said she enjoyed the love and respect of her subjects. Ghanaian President Nana Akufo Addo recalled her elegance and grace. To Queen Elizabeth's credit, she seemed to conduct her personal life well. In it, she was admired for her capacity to keep that stiff upper lip and carry on despite life shattering experiences. I am sure this capacity served Her Majesty well. When as an inexperienced 24 year old, her uncle, the rightful king, abdicated and she was thrust into leadership of a kingdom of such an expansive nature. This ability to carry on served her well when her immediate family itself faced so many personal challenges. The world experienced a great loss with the death of Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth's death, however, signifies the end of an era and at the end of an era it is fitting that analysis and review be conducted to reflect on the past in order not to repeat its errors the wisdom gained as a result could help us to strategize a better future for all or reflection to be worthwhile hard questions must be asked questions we did not ask before or were hesitant or afraid to ask questions that are quite appropriate to ask at this juncture. One overriding question is, what is now the status of the Commonwealth of Nations given the passing of the Queen and the rise of King Charles III? I think these nations have begun to question their status as is evident in issues raised as they mourn the former leader Elizabeth II. Some Commonwealth countries were ambivalent in their grief as in their reflections they were torn between sentiments of imperial nostalgia, a resentment of a history of silence and an acknowledgement of the empire's methodical plundering of their nations. And to them keeping the stiff upper lip the posture of betrayal was a choice of empire to have a blinkered vision. No one wants to puncture the bubble of presented perfected presentations that were representative of the monarchy as head of empire. Many people prefer to hold on to their illusions than to look into the nakedness of a painful reality. But we cannot unsee what was done in history, for it lives on in the present. Because this is why, for instance, a South African party leader remark that her death is a reminder of a very tragic period in his country and in Africa's history. He shared that never once did this head of empire acknowledge the evils 
inflicted on Africans. This is the painful truth, the underbelly of the keep calm and carry on principle. And the, to confront for analysis the monarchy's much lauded principle of keep calm and carry on the past is to conclude that the principle could be viewed as to a certain extent as a charade. An attempt to put blinkers over one's eyes does not accept that which one does not want to see or what one refuses to see. This kind of choice of a blinkered vision is and was a liability to the vulnerable. How can the monarchy just carry on without addressing the truths of empire? Beggars with whom the legacy of monarchy rests need to not hide behind luxurious lifestyles and take the blinkers off and face the history they created. The leaders of the empire and the monarchy must first acknowledge their wrongdoings and take full responsibility for them. Outside of this, this much esteemed structure of government is but a travesty. The relevancy of the leadership of the monarchy comes into question. How to many Commonwealth countries are left to wonder how to reconcile the pain of empire with the emotional entanglements with the queen in her death. The monarchy itself needs to make reparations. It needs to extend compassion and care to nations and peoples hurt more in its expansionist policies, policies that led to violence, exploitation, and displacement. This entity of the monarchy is now given an opportunity as a genre of leadership to ensure the wellness of its people. If more productive relationships are to be forged, the kind of relationship the nations will require in the future. In India, the largest Commonwealth country, one professor reported that in that nation, grief is interspersed with regret. Trust feel that Her Majesty never took responsibility for atrocities that were done in the name of empire. Hence, reports are that responses to her death were muted. According to the New York Times, the Indian people reflected on the fact that she gave a flimsy apology for the massacre that occurred in Amistad, a province in India, where in 1919, a British general ordered troops to fire on a peaceful gathering. The massacre swept hundreds there. The monarchy has blood on its hands. A pause for reflection is rightly called for at this juncture, where two seasons merge, the ending of one era and the beginning of the other. To look beyond the window dressing to see the exploitation that has propped up the empire. We must confront and deal with the types of violence, exploitation, and displacement endemic to this empire. We ca cannot allow bourgeoisie commentators to control the narratives of empire out of fear of being ridiculed for speaking out. But with childlike curiosity, driven by a desire for clarity and understanding, we must expose the nakedness of the splendor of empire. We will not be fooled by buzzwords and so-called experts, but we will consider and collate the empirical evidence. We will create perhaps parallel narratives that expose the truth previously undermined. The nakedness, if the emperor is naked, we must say so, must expose the nakedness of the emperor. Good faith, the child of empire must expose the hollowness of the empire's claims. Only then will the emperor or empress in good faith, clean himself and herself up and make apologies of empire and clothe himself with unaccustomed new garments required by the new seasons and times. The death of Queen Elizabeth II, occasion to review the institution of the monarchy and hold them to a higher standard than rises. Get that blinkered vision and refuse to just carry on ignoring the nakedness of the emperor. Oh yes, we need to move beyond condolences and amendments. It is time to puncture the mystique that surrounds pampered royalty. No longer should they be sequestered in their truth, but we should let the truth of empire come forth.
Prime could forge new resplendent truths by bringing the Commonwealth into full positioning in a win-win position. The practice of radical transparency will be a step in the right direction. What ways to extend compassion and care to the nations and peoples they've hurt will be another applaudable gesture. The end of the reign of Queen Elizabeth is the time to do so. This is Ingrid Rizzolo and it has been my talk. Do not forget to like, comment and subscribe. Bye for now.